that was a quick summary of everything that I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, so feel free to fall asleep a little bit because I can't compete with a sloth, right? Um, so like I said, I first went 10 years ago to the jungle and I was a young 24 year old kid and I wanted to plant churches in tribes that had no churches in areas where they had never heard of the name of Jesus. And I got there and I spent my first couple of years trying to get to know the area, get to know what was happening. And I was surprised to find out that the vast majority of tribes already have churches. Some of them have had churches for 50, 60, 70 years. But I was also surprised to learn that the majority of these tribes have really unhealthy churches. False teaching, false doctrine, legalism is rampant. I even met some guys who were witch doctors and they were also the pastors. And I realized, how in the world did this happen? What happened, because in our area, short-term teams have been really bad. Short-term missions is fantastic. I want to encourage you all to go on short-term trips. But in our area, it's been a lot of, we're going to take the gospel and leave and never go back and teach and train. So they've had missionaries go in with the gospel. They believe it. They hand them a Bible. What comes next? They do the best they can with what they have. And which doctor is the pastor? So we felt the Lord burdening us to help with this instead of us being the ones who are going to plant the churches what if we take the time to train these pastors so that they can have healthy churches and then they can be the ones who take the gospel to these other tribes so there's a verse that's been really foundational for us in our ministry this isn't going to be all about our ministry tonight y'all are in this too so if you can open your bibles to colossians 1 verse 28 this is a text that we've really taken to heart for what we do but I think it's also very important for you all as you try to live out the Great Commission here in North Carolina. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. My wife always tells me I don't give people time to find it in their Bible, so I'll wait a few seconds. Colossians 1, 28. This is Paul writing. He's speaking to the Colossian church, and he's speaking of Jesus. And he says, Jesus, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. So Paul's saying, we proclaim Jesus. We're warning everyone. We're teaching everyone with wisdom. And what's the goal? That they be mature believers, mature disciples in Christ. That sounds pretty straightforward, right? We proclaim Christ. Of course that's what we do. We're the church. But how many of us are doing it? How many churches today are doing this? And it seems like a lot of churches would want to change this verse a little bit. Instead of saying, we proclaim Christ, we preach Christ. It's more, eh, we'll occasionally mention Christ because we don't want to offend people that may not believe like we do. Instead of warning people of the wrath to come and the need to repent, oh, that sounds mean. We can't do that. Instead of trying to present people mature in Christ, no, we want to... Uh, we want people to feel good about themselves. That's our goal as a church. But that is not our mission as a church. We have the mission to preach Christ because he's the only hope of salvation. He's our only hope for forgiveness. We warn uh, other people of the wrath to come and the need to repent. We teach with wisdom the Bible so that they know how to live out the Christian life and they know how to please the Lord. And the goal of all this is so that they can be mature believers and they can represent Christ well here on earth. That's our call, and that, to me, sounds a lot like the Great Commission, right? The call to make disciples. It's a different way of putting it, but it's the exact same thing. And there's a book that I read a few years ago called uh, Gospel Fluency. And in it, the author compares American Christians to, he talks really highly of American Christians, right? But there's also some critiques, and he compares us to the typical American that goes into a Mexican restaurant. So how many people here speak Spanish? Besides my wife? <laughs> yeah, yeah, un poco, yeah. How many speak at least a couple of words? Yeah, we all know gracias, baño, right, the basics. So imagine you go into the Mexican restaurant, you know, you have your Hispanic waiter, you feel like practicing. So you say, hola, you know, hey. So you sit down, he hands you the menu, and you say, gracias. Thank you. Well, what's he going to do? Oh, this person speaks Spanish. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo te va? ¿Qué vas a tomar? ¿Quieres comer esto o esto? Deer in headlights, right? 
because you do not speak Spanish. You're giving the appearance of it, but you don't actually speak Spanish. This is how a lot of Christians are today in the churches. We've memorized gospel lingo, you know, church cliches. Jesus died for your sins. Yeah, but what does that mean? What happens when someone has a question about that? Uh, we're like little kids with the Sunday school answer, right? Jesus. But yeah, but what does it mean? Or can you answer my questions? How do I apply the gospel to my life? Oftentimes in the jungle, I would say we're like parrots. You know, we hear and we repeat, but we can't speak with fluency the language of the gospel. So for example, if a man comes to you and, and you know that he's not a believer and he's crying because he just found out that his wife is having an affair and you realize you need to teach this man about Jesus and, and help him though he's hurting, if you say, you're a sinner, you need to repent, <laughs> right? That is true. He is a sinner. He needs to repent, but that is not the good news of the gospel that he needs to hear in that moment. He needs to hear that Christ will be faithful like your wife was not. That Christ will love you even when you don't deserve it in a way that your wife never could. And we know that because he came and gave his life for you. Or another example, right? These are crazy examples, but I think we understand the point, right? Like if a, a woman comes and her child has recently passed away from cancer, and you, ah, Jesus was raised on the third day. Yes, he was. That's true. She needs to believe that but that's not helping her in her time right now. We have to learn how to speak the gospel fluently to that person. She needs to hear, that is horrible. That's not how God designed the world. But thankfully, God's doing something about it. And that if you trust in Christ, when he comes, he's going to put an end to sickness, sin, and death, and you will see a new creation where you never have to shed another tear. That's good news. And that's how we see Paul in Acts. Every time he would go to one of the churches or one of the cities, he would use this type of, we would call it contextualization. When he went to the Jews, he taught like a Jew. He used the Old Testament and he tried to prove Jesus was the Messiah. When he went to the Gentiles, he didn't do it that way. They didn't have the Old Testament. They didn't know what a Messiah was. So he taught the same message, but in a different way. Paul sought to teach with wisdom, as this verse says. So you all hear this and hopefully you think, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. But that's what Paul did. You know, that's what pastors or missionaries do. That's for them. What does this have to do with me? Well, Paul, later in chapter 3 of this same uh, book, Colossians 3.16, says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing or warning one another. That sounds familiar, right? That's the exact same thing. Paul saying in uh, chapter 1, this is what I'm doing. And now to the church, hey, this isn't just my job. You all do this too. Preach Christ. Warn other people. Teach the believers all so that we can make disciples. Make sense? So you don't have to be doing this in the Amazon jungle like we are. right? God has called each of us to be witnesses for Jesus wherever he has us. You know, for you, that might be being faithful as a homeschool mom to disciple your kids. Or that could be being faithful to talk about the gospel or Jesus anytime a coworker starts to mention his crazy religious beliefs, right? This is gonna look different for every person. For us, it's stuff with tribes in the Amazon. For you, it could be all kinds of stuff. Don't feel like you were any less of a believer or any less of a missionary because God has given you those relationships. He's put you in these opportunities to proclaim Christ. And I know some of you have been on uh, mission trips overseas. For whatever reason, it is so much easier to do this when you're overseas. It's easy to proclaim Christ when you're in you know, South America, when you're in Peru, when you're in Africa, when you're in Asia. But when the family comes over for Thanksgiving, you know, the cousins, the aunts, the uncles are there. It's hard to be a witness for Jesus. It's hard for me. But we know that God has given us those relationships so that we can be witnesses for Christ. We need to proclaim him even when it's difficult. And this is something that we've tried to do in our ministry in the jungle. So we saw these unhealthy churches, we realized that this was a problem, and we wanted to do something about it. This is what we felt the Lord calling us to help with. And one of the ways that we help is through teaching in two different seminary programs, four tribal groups in our city. Our city is called Pucalpa. It's a big jungle city in Peru. There's around 200,000 people. And there's a lot of tribes that live in the area. 
they have good Spanish because they live close to the Peruvian town. So they'll come in, we train them, they go out to their villages, and we're seeing them plant churches, and we're seeing their churches become healthy. But we've also seen a problem with this strategy, specifically with the groups that are more isolated, right? Those are the ones that are harder to get to. That means they're also harder to bring to us. So, for example, for us to get to the village or to bring them in, you have to take a little tiny float plane that lands in the river, a max of four people, and it costs $2,000 round trip. Four people. So if we're trying to do a seminary program of 20, 25 people, that's crazy, right? No one can do that. So how do we reach them? And we also realized that some of these really unhealthy churches, their pastors had studied at Bible seminaries and institutes in the city. And they were teaching horrible, crazy stuff. What was the disconnect? Because those seminaries aren't teaching bad stuff. It was because they were trying to take all these different tribal groups that have different cultures, different languages, don't speak Spanish very well, bring them to the city and teach them in Spanish and send them back out. That's hard. It's hard to understand the Bible sometimes in our own language when you're going in your second language, it's not very good. They're just not getting it. So it's not necessarily their fault. It's just a bad strategy for those type of people groups. So we wanted to obey Colossians 1 and try to teach these groups with wisdom. But what did that look like? So three years ago, we felt the Lord uh, leading us to take the seminary training to their villages instead of bringing them to us. So we do still teach in those, uh, those seminaries in Pucallpa, but we started two seminary programs uh, with two different tribal groups in their villages. And this way we're able to go to them. We teach in Spanish, um, but everything is easily translated into their language because there's only one language. We do it in their village, so we can customize everything to the way they do things, the way that they learn. And by doing it this way, uh, you saw some of the quotes in the video. We had one guy, after teaching the Old Testament, say, I haven't been this happy since my first son was born. Which is crazy after studying Leviticus, right? right? And another guy said, I've wanted to study the Bible, but I don't speak Spanish, and I'm too poor to make it to the city. I never thought this would be possible. So we're seeing fruit. We're seeing these men encouraged, and we're seeing them not only... Uh, try to remove the false teaching in their own churches, but they're even planting churches. One of our students just planted a church in his village this year. Two years ago, he was the only believer. Now there's 10 believers there, and he's leading the church. And we're very thankful that we just had our first graduating class, uh, specifically from the Matzes tribe. So they were the ones in the video that were throwing their hats. They've seen movies, so they wanted to be like that. Um, yeah, so we've seen these 14 men graduate they're planning churches. They're uh, going on mission trips themselves to other Matzes villages that don't have churches. And something really unique to the Matzes tribe is their location. Those panoramic uh, shots that you saw, that other side of the river is Brazil. So the river is the, uh, the border, and you can literally swim to Brazil. But I don't recommend it because it's very illegal. So they live in a giant reserve for indigenous groups. So there's all these uncontacted tribes that live there right next to them. And in the entire world, there's around 100 uncontacted tribes left. So that's not just groups that don't have the gospel, that's groups that are living naked in the woods. 100 in the world. At least 14 live in this reserve next to the Matzes. So by reaching the Matzes, by strengthening their church, by sending them out as missionaries, because they have legal access to go in and make contact, we could get the gospel to 14% of the uncontacted tribes in the world, which is incredible. I don't want to make that sound like, oh, yeah, next year they'll have that done. No, this is going to take a lifetime, right? They're hard to find. There's probably going to be violent encounters, but it's possible. And it's not something that I can do. It's not something Peruvians can do, Brazilians can do. The Matzes the can do it. All they need is for the Lord to give them the, the desire to help them understand that they need the gospel too. And the Lord's doing it. So they're starting right now with their own people, but they understand, hey, those groups are sinful. They need the gospel as well. So pray with us that the Lord will call some of them and send them out. But we also realize that we're focusing on the current pastors. What about the next generation of pastors? Uh, so we've started youth camps with the Matzes, and this next year hopefully with another tribe as well. Uh, last year we had our first youth camp and we had 60 stu uh, students, and this past year we had 120. 
and the pastors um, asked us for help teaching their youth. So that's how this idea came about. The pastor of the church where we have our own our, our hut, basically, um, he's a funny guy. He was the guy who made contact with the missionaries 50 years ago. Uh, so the Matzes are recently contacted 50 years ago, and he said, Hey, Casey, when I was a teenager, I was in a loincloth running around in the woods. The teenagers today have cell phones. I have no idea what I'm doing. How can we reach them? So that's where the youth camp idea came about. And since then, the pastors are saying, oh, the youth are actually coming to church. We're seeing them believe the gospel. We're seeing them repent. Uh, there's some of them that are um, hopefully going to sign up for our seminary program when they graduate. And even, I'll have to explain this, but at the end of this uh, youth camp, one couple, a teenage couple, got married because they were tired of living in sin. So in tribal culture, usually by 14, 15, 16, you've already got your, your spouse and you've got two, three kids. So it's an interesting demographic because they're teenagers, right? They deal with teenage problems, but they also deal with very real mature problems as well. So this time we had a 15-year-old guy ask us, how can I stop committing adultery? 15. He already had kids and his you know, wife. <laughs> so we're seeing slowly, but we're seeing fruit through these camps and then through our seminary programs. And that's basically our ministry. Uh, we also have our hands in Bible translation with the Matzes. Uh, we help with medical things. Julie has a background um, in medicine. And we do several things like that around the city. But primarily, our focus is the seminary training for the tribal pastors and the youth camps. And by doing so, like I said, we're seeing churches become healthy and tribal pastors being sent out to preach the gospel. So, this is where you guys come in. We need churches and individuals to partner with us so that we can continue and expand this work. We have to raise, for example, all of the money, all of the funds for this. Um, so we need financial partners, for one. Uh, we're looking for monthly donors um, that would either be willing to give monthly or support projects such as, oh, I'll sponsor this seminary, I'll sponsor this youth camp, things like that. And we know that the Lord could give unlimited resources to us and to every other missionary that's going to come through here. But he doesn't do it that way. It's because we need one another. We are the church. I'm not the church in, in Peru. You all aren't the church here. We are all the church. We're all called to take the gospel to the nations. We can't do that without churches like you all. None of us can get into the tribes like the Matzes can. We all need one another, and that's how the Lord has designed it. Um, some are called to go, and others are called to stay and give so that others can go. Both are equally important. You can also partner with us through going. So, so far we haven't had any teams come down from this area, but the doors are open. Um, so we're talking with Lon Chinowith um, this year to try to figure out what, what it would look like for a team from this area to come down. There's no details about that yet, but stay tuned. And it definitely helps if you speak Spanish, so be practicing if that interests you. But it's not necessary. You could help with other things. Yeah, go to your local Mexican restaurant, support it, um, <laughs> practice. Mexican food is our favorite food, so we're really excited to be back. Because in Peru, there's, no, there's not even tortillas hardly. Um, the word taco in Peruvian Spanish means high heels, like for women. So I'm really excited to be here and have Mexican food. Um, and finally, you all can partner with us through prayer. And I never want it to sound like prayer is just something that you tack on to the end of a presentation. Um, we fully realize that any healthy ministry has prayer as the foundation. And we have these big dreams for the Amazon. And we realize that none of that will happen if the Lord's people aren't coming together praying in, uh, to that end. So please pray with us. Um, you can pray with us for the continued fruitfulness of these camps and seminaries. We have seen in our 10 years seasons of ministry very dry, where we're trying to faithfully preach the gospel and just nothing's happening. And then the last couple of years, it seems like we're preaching the gospel and everything is happening. So we're in an incredibly fruitful season, and we don't know how long it's going to last. We pray it'll last years, so pray with us for that. Um, pray that these tribal believers will be able to uh, teach their churches well so that their churches can become healthy and that the Lord will call them to get the gospel to these other tribes. And then pray that the Lord will do more in the Amazon than what we can imagine. And we're imagining some big stuff. So I hope you're encouraged by what the Lord is doing in the jungle. 
Um, it seems crazy that just 10 years ago, you know, I went and then now there's four seminary programs and these pastors are being trained and that's all the Lord. So I've messed up so many things. I've fumbled in my Spanish and the Lord works in it. So it's been great just to see how the Lord works through my weakness and in our weaknesses. And this is not a quick work. Uh, the seminaries alone take three years for them to be graduates. Um, and Julie and I are in this for the long haul. It's easy since she's from the jungle city that we're in, so that's home to us. Um, so you can partner with us and uh, take one of our prayer cards. We set them in the back. It's got, um, well, I would say it's, it's got a pretty photo because my wife's in it and the sloth is in it. Right? So that makes it a pretty photo, yeah. And it's got information on how to give and also how to join our newsletter group. So we send updates via Facebook group. Um, that way we can send more photos and videos, but we also do uh, via email if that would interest you. And please don't get into the habit of thinking that, again, that this is just for those who live overseas. This is just for those who are full-time missionaries. Paul's words to the Colossians are true for us, the same as they're true for you. This week, try to think, pray about it. Who in your life has God put there that doesn't know Christ? Who has God put there that knows Christ but needs to be trained and discipled and taught the Bible with wisdom so that they can be mature disciples? The Lord will show you. I don't know who that is. It could be a family member. It could be a co-worker. Who knows? Seek the Lord, and he'll show you where you need to be focusing your time. So I'm going to pray, and then I'll do a slideshow of photos. It'll just run through. Um, so if you all have questions, ask away. If not, then I can comment on the photos or, or whatever you all like to do. So I'll pray to end the time. Lord, thank you for the gospel. Um, thank you for saving us first and foremost. And then thank you for involving us in your work to save the lost. We know that it doesn't depend on, on us, on how good our uh, presentation of the gospel is. As long as we are faithful to proclaim Christ's death and resurrection, that you will do your work to save people. Thank you for involving us in the Great Commission and give us wisdom and courage to do it well. We pray this for, in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen.